Sir, good evening, sir. Good evening, Kishore. Sir, how are you, sir? I'm fine. So, My all well? Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, sir. You are looking same, same, sir. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Actually, now I believe I am very happy to see you, very active and very energetic person like you in IAP. So, it's great. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Madam, welcome, Madam. Kasi Bharti, Madam, welcome, Madam. With your activities, that's great. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, speaker, sir. Today's speaker, sir, ma'am. Okay, sir. So, namaskar. Unmute, Madam. Unmute. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Madam. So, you are at which place, ma'am? Karnul, sir. Sir. Uh... I'm in Karnul, sir, Andhra Pradesh. Yeah, yeah, Karnul. Okay, so Karnul, Dr. Rafi, Ken Sudhakar were there, that same Karnul. Na? Yeah. Sir, working in Narayan Medical College, ma'am. I, okay, I think more than okay. five years. Okay. More than five years. When I was PG, sir was the assistant at that time. Okay, okay. So I'm the student of uh, Dr. Sudhakar, sir, and Dr. Rafi, sir, sir. Okay. Yes, yes. Sir. That's great. <laughs> <clears throat> now we are in Ames Patna, sir. Yes, now we have come back to my home state. That okay, way. okay. So I am at Ames Patna. Okay. Could you please share your presentation, ma'am? We'll, we'll check, ma'am. Check your presentation, ma'am. Yeah, yes. check the movement of the slides. Yeah. Share screen, ma'am. Is that okay? Yeah, ma'am. Yeah. Move yeah. the slides, ma'am. Yeah, now it's okay. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Move, move the slide, ma'am. Next slide, if you please. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Okay, ma'am. Exit, ma'am. Done. Done. Yeah. Thanks. So you do, did your FNB in PHU? Yes, sir. Gangaram, sir. Okay, so you are a student of uh, Manas, sir, same, Manas Kalra. Yes, sir. And uh, Anupam, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. You were after Nita or a contemporary of Nita? No, no, sir. I am from between 2018 to 20. They are okay. yes, so seniors, 10 years ahead of me. <laughs> okay, okay. Hello, Satish. Welcome, Satish. Today's sir, moderator. Good morning, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, Satish. I'm Dr. Chandra Mohan, Professor at the Head Department of Pediatrics, Ames Patna. Here I am sir. leading the Pediatric Hematology Oncology Unit. Sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. So, Dr. Satish, where are you placed at? So, I am at uh, Rajmandri, sir, Andhra. Okay, you are with Ramakrishna Paravan, sir? Yes, sir. Okay, he, he is a very good friend of mine. He is a very gentle man. Sir. I am much junior to him, sir. Yeah, I know, I know. You are a, quite a young fellow. Yes, <laughs> So, sir, is in ashram. You are in medical college or you are in private practice? No, sir. I go as a visiting, sir, visiting consultant in medical college. Okay. Uh, I have my own practice, sir. Okay. At Rajmandri itself. At Rajmandri itself, sir. Actually, I went to Thiruvannamalai, sir, yesterday. Just now I came from, just now I'm coming from Thiruvannamalai. Uh, sir, welcome, you, sir. You went for some exam or something? No, sir, for the Darshan. Darshan, okay. It's famous temple. Yes, it's Thiruvannamalai. You have to walk for 14 kilometers. Oh, that's a... 
సార్ నమస్కారం సార్ నేను డాక్టర్ చంద్రమోహన్ ప్రొఫెసర్ హెడ్ డిపార్ట్మెంట్ ఆఫ్ పిడాటిక్స్ ఏం పట్టున్నారు సార్ నో సీ సార్ సార్ అన్మ్యూట్ సార్ సురేష్ సార్ అన్మ్యూట్ గుడ్ ఈవెనింగ్ గుడ్ ఈవెనింగ్ సార్ గుడ్ ఈవెనింగ్ ఎవరిబడి గుడ్ ఈవెనింగ్ సార్ గుడ్ ఈవెనింగ్ సతీష్ అట్లా స్పష్టంగా వచ్చారు షూర్ ఏం కాదు సార్ ఇప్పుడు మళ్ళీ ఇంకో చోట పరిగెట్టాలి సార్ అది మొత్తం రాజమండ్రి అంతా నేను ఐఎంఏ మీటింగ్ అండి సార్ అందుకు ఫోన్ చేశారు ఐఎంఏ 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 మీటింగ్ అండి సార్ ఐఎంఏ మీటింగ్ ఐ నాట్ పవర్ఫుల్ ఐఎంఏ మీటింగ్ ఏదో కన్స్ట్రక్షన్ స్టార్ట్ చేసే చేస్తున్నారుగా కన్స్ట్రక్షన్ గురించి కాదు సార్ ఇది మామూలు జనరల్ బాడీ మీటింగ్ పెట్టారు అంటే మీటింగ్ ఏంటంటే మెయిన్ ఇప్పుడు మనకి జగన్ అది వస్తున్నాయి కదా సార్ జగన్ అన్న క్లినిక్స్ వచ్చినాయి కదా ఇప్పుడు అంటే ఇప్పుడు దాకా ఏంటంటే మనకి ఇది డిమాండ్ వచ్చు అవర్ దగ్గర ప్రెషర్ లేదు మనకి ఏమైనా పని ఏమైనా అవ్వాలన్నా సరే ఒకసారి అంటే వెళ్ళి కనబడి వచ్చేస్తుంటే పని అయిపోతున్నాయి మనకి డిమాండ్ వచ్చు నుంచి కూడా క్వశ్చన్ ఎక్కువ ఉండట్లేదు లేదంటే ఫైర్ అనివర్సరీ లేదని చెప్పి యూజువల్ ఆపేయచ్చు ఇప్పుడు ఎవరిని వెళ్ళండి అయ్యే బాబు ఒక రోజు నెల ఒక రోజు వెళ్ళండి అన్నా సరే గొంతులు వేసేస్తున్నారు మా జనాలు ఇప్పుడు అది ఏమవుతుందంటే తర్వాత రిపర్కషన్ స్టార్ట్ అయినాయి అంటే మళ్ళీ లైసెన్స్ కి ఇట్లు కావాలని రైడింగ్ చేశారు అనుకోండి సార్ అది లేదు ఇది లేదని చెప్పి ఊరికే న్యూసెన్స్ మనకి అందుకని చెప్పి ఒకసారి బాబు మరి ఇది పరిస్థితి మేము మేము పట్టించుకోవడం వదిలేమంటారా మీరు ఏమైనా వెళ్తారా అని చెప్పి అడగడానికి బేసిక్ గా అది అంటే ఇప్పుడు ఏమంది సార్ వాళ్ళు అడుగుతారు నెలలో ఒక రోజు కొంచెం ఏదో మొహం చూపించి ఒక గంట మొహం చూపించి వచ్చినాం అనుకోండి పని అయిపోతుంది కదా సార్ మనకి వాళ్ళకి కావాల్సిన మంది ఉన్నారు అపాయింటెడ్ ఇట్లే వాళ్ళకి కాంది ఉన్నా ఉంటే చేయొచ్చు దానికి ఏం లేదు కాంది అని కాదు సార్ అంటే ఇప్పుడు ఏమవుతుందంటే ఇప్పుడు మనకి ఎగ్జాంపుల్ సార్ నా హాస్పిటల్ ఉంది ఇప్పుడు హాస్పిటల్ ఏంటంటే మన పాత పాత సిస్టర్స్ ఉంటారు కదా సార్ వీళ్ళందరూ ఏఎన్ఎమ్స్ కానీ లేదంటే మన దగ్గర వచ్చి నేర్చుకుని డిగ్రీ కూడా ఏమి ఉండదు ఇప్పుడు ఏమైనా ఇష్టం అయింది అనుకోండి వీళ్ళు ఏమైనా వచ్చి గొడవ చేశారు అనుకోండి మళ్ళా అది తలకి ఉంటుంది కదా సార్ ఏ మనకి మనకు తెలిసి బాగా చేసేస్తాడు తెలుసు కాకపోతే ఏంటంటే అవడో కూడా ఏదో న్యూస్ చేస్తాడు మళ్ళీ ఇప్పుడు అవన్నీ పెట్టినాం అనుకోండి అవడో కూడా ఏదో ఒకటి అంటాడు డిఫెక్ట్ ఇంకా డిఫెక్ట్ ఉన్నప్పుడు స్టాఫ్ కింద వాళ్ళని చూపించిన ఎవరో సర్టిఫికేట్ ఉన్న వాళ్ళని చూపించుకోవాల్సింది చూపించాలంటే సార్ ఇప్పుడు మనం అనుకుంటాం సార్ కార్పొరేట్ రాజమండ్రి కార్పొరేట్ దిగేటప్పుడు స్టాఫ్ అందరూ నెత్తుకెళ్ళిపోతున్నారు సార్ నాకు ఎన్ఐసి ముగ్గురు మానేసారు సార్ రీసెంట్ గా సిక్స్ మంత్స్ కి నాకు ముగ్గురు వెళ్ళిపోయారు నాకు నాకు బాగా చేసే వాళ్ళు మరి వెళ్ళిపోతున్నారంటే మరి నాకు నష్టమే కదా సార్ పని నేర్పించుకొని కొంచెం రిలాక్స్ అవుతా అనుకుంటే వెళ్ళిపోతా ఉంటే ఇబ్బంది కదా మీకు కార్పొరేషన్ దగ్గరకు వస్తే గానీ గుర్తొచ్చేట్లేదు సరే చెప్పాలా ఎంతవరకు వచ్చింది అదే సార్ అది బాగానే వెళ్తాం సార్ దాట్లీ కీపింగ్ థింగ్స్ రెడీ అవడాన్ని అవుతా ఉన్నాయి కల్చరల్ ప్రాక్టీస్ స్టార్ట్ చేశారు అదర్ థింగ్స్ సైంటిఫిక్ ఈవెంట్స్ కి కోఆర్డినేషన్ చేస్తున్నాము ఫైనాన్షియల్స్ కూడా కొంచెం పుష్ చేస్తున్నాము సో గోయింగ్ ఆన్ అన్ని చూస్తే అంత మిగుళ్లే ఖర్చులు ఏం పెట్టేటట్లేడు చూద్దాం సార్ మరి ఎట్లా వస్తుంది బాగానే ఉండాలి సార్ అది నమస్కారం సార్ రామకృష్ణ సార్ సార్ వెల్కమ్ సార్ వెల్కమ్ మిమ్మల్ని 
nanna it is uh, it refers to cm <laughs> the cm of 2022 2023 suddenly exuded with matter okay. we call him as cm cm chandra mohan eh? cm right cm <laughs> He is maintaining that leadership qualities in the Ibu meeting. <laughs> vocal. Sir is dynamic, sir. Ah, because vocal in getting th- uh, things done for East Zone. Okay. Or East Zone got it is it is because of him. Very logically and uh, reasonably. Oh, <laughs> Welcome, Sai. Next speaker, sir. Is getting ready. First ever. मैडम सर खासी बात है फर्स्ट वन सर हेलो साई आई एम योर फेलो एंड यू सर पिलचे एंड और मैं क्रेडिट नहीं तो मैं था सर सर आई थिंक इज इन जर्नी सर I know, I know, sir. I am trying to say, India. Sure, huh? Telling. Kiriti, Kiriti, Jennila, or not? Ah, the Telusu chapter, Majan chapter, that is saying. Majan. That is March chapter, sir. Parai pote ne, ant ke telu. Chapter kaal esen, sir. Yes, sir. Ah, justice. No, no, no. Telusu Jennila return lo onna daina. Chapter, sir. Saying kar meeting lo. Sai, welcome, Sai. Sir, thank you. Sir, good evening, sir. Sir, right. Your video is off. Your <laughs> yes, sir. Video. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, good. Uh, can you please share your slide, sir? One minute, fast. You just check the slides. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hello. We proceed next. Barth, Barth, can you go check, sir? Yeah, yeah, check it, sir. She's fine. She's ready. Can you can you please move the shares? Next slide. Ah okay sir. Make it uh, slides. Okay done done. Close it. Close ah, it. Okay. Close it. Yeah thank you. Welcome Sai. Thank you thank you sir. Sir shall we start sir for the session? Yeah. Yes. One second. So welcome to. All of you. This is October month, UACME, uh, which is running successfully. And uh, today we are uh, going to mm, we are going to present new speakers. It's a good good to- with good topics. And uh, I would like to welcome our uh, AAP AP President Dr. Suresh Babu sir to introduce our the uh, chairperson of this month. So, welcome. I welcome you all on behalf of IAP AP chapter to this. cool evening in october we have with us as first i congratulate the new central iap members who are got elected to the central iap unopposed huh? so it shows that we are united huh? okay now we welcome today's our chairman hmm? yes, dr unanim sri chandra mohan चंद्रमोहन कुमार प्रोफेसर एंड हेड ऑफ पेडियाट्रिक सालिड एंड मेडिकल सेंसेस पाटना पेडियाट्रिक हेमटालजी आंकालजी अडल्ट एंड हेल्थ एंड वैक्सीनालजी आर हिज पेट टॉपिक्स एंड हिज सेंट्रल आईएपी मेंबर 2022 2023 एंड मेंबर एसीवीआईपी एंड ऑफ आईएपी 2022 एंड 23 For his credit, he has 47 papers in international, national, general, and 19 book chapters. Associate editor, postgraduate general of pediatric and adolescent medicine. He be member Indian Pediatrics 2017 to 2019. Member Independent Ethics Committee of IAP. Subject expert in pharmacovigilance and program of India. Awarded scholarship to attend second Afro. Advac, advanced vaccinology course at Johannesburg from 3rd September to 12th September 9, 2018. So, Alinda Institute, in Alinda Institute, first 
they start writing papers before so it and any aims is known for paper writing and paper publications so that knack also we have to teach to other institutions and right? percolate to other institutions also we are very now post grads are very in need of that sir because it is made mandatory that be be being bit struggled struggling to get topics or to get papers published also and for promotions also it is mean as per nmc guideline it is made necessary also just because they work but they don't have that accept how to make a paper out of their work so yeah. regarding that we have to conduct one cme on our platform huh? ap sure. platform we invite you for that also just now i hand out to dr kishore sir, thank to you sir this today's program thank you sir thank you thank you very much sir And uh, we'll we'll go we'll start your sitting, sir. One, one minute, one minute. Yeah, you should be delivered a lecture in Canada. Ah huh? yes, sir. yes, sir. Right. <laughs> That is Mr. Him. And uh, to, I would like to introduce our uh, moderator today's moderator is Dr. Satish Datla from Rajamandri. He's a practicing neonatologist in Rajamandri. He's done in the MBBS from Mahatma Gandhi Medical Hi. College, Pondicherry, and uh, MD Pediatrics from Ailur Ashram Medical College. And DM Nina Dutch from Chettinad University. Sir, welcome, Dr. Satish Datla. Sir, uh, thank you, sir. Yeah, you can sir, proceed. Uh, uh, today's topics are two topics, sir, and uh, one is uh, uh, approach to uh, thrombocytopenia by Dr. Kasi Bharathi, ma'am, uh, who has done uh, MBBS from Kannur Medical College, which is a prestigious institute in in our state, and uh, she has done from. Uh, Lotus uh, Children's Hospital DNB Pediatrics, and she has done uh, fellowship in National Board in uh, Pediatric Chemo Oncology, and uh, she has worked in different uh, uh, institutes, which are premium institutes in uh, India, and she has uh, different publications from in, uh, national as well as international publications, and uh, uh, handing over to Dr. Bharti Madams. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your warm introduction. I'll uh, just share my screen. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Visible, sir. Yes, yes. Okay. Table to move. Please share again, madam. Yes, yes. Yes. But the slides are not moving, sir. You can move, ma'am. The arrow mark is there. No. Yeah, that one. Yes. Yeah. So today I am going to discuss about how we approach uh, to thrombocytopenia in children. What? Start seeing again. Refresh. I think that means start. Sir, I'm audible, sir. Yeah, yeah, audible. Yes, yes, yes. You are audible. So today I'm going to discuss about how we approach to thrombocytopenia in children. I'll be discussing under these headings. So for better understanding the pathophysiology behind the thrombopenia, thrombocytopenic diseases, first we should know about the regular thrombopoiesis and how the platelets are going to function. So first we'll see the thrombopoiesis. Uh, this is a pluripotent stem cell. This uh, pluripotent stem cell undergo commitment through megakaryocytic uh, transcription factors like GATA1, FAG1, and FLI1. And uh, after this, the committed uh, megakaryoblast uh, will form. This megakaryoblast uh, will undergo different uh, differentiation, like early differentiation and terminal differentiation. And uh, they have the capacity to Uh, divider like cell division capacity so they are going to form immature megakaryocytes and mature megakaryocytes so after forming this mature megakaryocyte from megakaryocytic uh, colony forming unit they lose the capacity to further divider so they undergo endo reduplicate endo re reduplication and polypoidization like this and after that cell uh, going into fragmentation and platelets are going to release into the circulation from megakaryocyte this is called thrombopoiesis Why is why this is important means 
in inherited thrombocytopenias we are going to see number of gene mutations so various genes are going to participate in these uh, differentiation process and whenever there is a mutation in these genes we are going to see some inherited thrombocytopenias so now we'll see the normal platelets and their function normal platelet uh, lifespan is 7 to 10 days and uh, almost uh, one third of the platelets are going to locate in the spleen and two thirds are uh, in the circulation the main platelet diameter is 1 to 2 micrometer and uh, whereas the rbc diameter is around 6 to 8 micrometer so it is small normal platelet volume is uh, mean platelet volume is 8 to 11 femtoliters this is important for us and platelets are uh, non nucleated cells whereas rbc is a nucleated cells platelets are non nucleated cells so there is an entity called reticulated platelets uh, these are uh, platelets as i told non nucleated but those platelets released recently from the bone marrow they will contain some rna these are called these are called reticulated platelets these reticulated platelets account for 8 to 16% of the total count why this is important means in some tertiary care hospitals usually we are going to measure ipf like immature platelet fraction the, the there they are going to measure these reticulated platelets if this ipf is uh, more that indicates the marrow is active and the production is normal but the platelets are undergoing peripheral destruction in case of thrombocytopenia in case of thrombocytopenia if ipf is uh, low that indicates the marrow is not active that is the significance and this is the picture showing normal platelet function these two are platelets and platelet membrane contains usually integral gly glycoproteins like glycoprotein 2b 3a glycoprotein 1b 9 these helps in platelet platelet adhesion and platelet endothelial cell adhesion so once the platelet uh, adhesion is going to happen then they are going to undergo activation so then after activate uh, after the activated platelets are going to release some contents from the granules so inside of the platelet there are some granules like dense granules and alpha granules they are going to release uh, some contents like fibrinogen von willebrand factor and serotonin like that and they are going to help in aggregation of the platelets and apart from adhesion and aggregation uh, capacity these platelet membrane also has phospholipid surface to that surface other coagulation factors are going to attach so uh, these all things are important in primary hemostasis and secondary hemostasis this is how all the platelets are going to aggregate and apart from that fibrin is going to clot this is loose platelet plug this is a uh, uh, we are going to see primary hemostasis after that with the help of other coagulation factors we are going to see uh, stable clot that is in secondary hemostasis so when uh, what is thrombocytopenia we will uh, now see the topic per se what is thrombocytopenia means it is defined as platelet count of less than 1 lakh per cubic mm counts below 1.5 lakh also mentioned in some textbooks but uh, if it is stable uh, for almost 6 months we won't usually consider it as a thrombocytopenia whenever you are encountering a thrombocytopenia in coulter report we have always it should be we should always could be collaborated corroborated by peripheral smear by the pathologist when we have to intervene this thrombocytopenia now no need to intervene for every count but uh, there is uh, some threshold to intervene definitely that is in children 10 to 10, 20000 per cubic mm if the in some conditions whenever the child is having high grade fever with a platelet count of 20000 we need to intervene even if there is no fever or underlying illness if less than 10000 we need to intervene to prevent ic bleeds and in units we are going to keep little bit higher count 20000 to 50000 so whenever there is a defect uh, defect in the production problem uh, that thrombocytopenia is uh, going to have severe problem than the peripheral destruction problem so this graph is showing the uh, correlation between platelet count and major bleeding percentage so whenever uh, there is a injury only 50000 platelet count is required to achieve uh, to attain primary hemostasis so whenever there is a mild to moderate thrombocytopenia up to more than 20000 per cubic mm even with a significant trauma also sometimes rarely they are going to be symptomatic but less than 20000 or less than 10000 there are chances for spontaneous bleeding so that's why we are going to intervene the same thing is uh, depicting uh, depicting in this uh, graph so how we are going to classify this thrombocytopenia there are uh, different types uh, categories uh, to classify this thrombocytopenia based on the platelet size that is the mean platelet volume and another thing is a mode of acquisition like acquired or inherited 
and based on the mechanism whether that is a production problem or destruction problem or because of hemodilution or because of uh, based on the degree of thrombocytopenia one by one we'll see so based on the size of the platelets uh, we are going to measure uh, mean platelet volume uh, usually the coulter will give the mean platelet volume and after that we will see in the ps also so uh, the commonest low mpv conditions are viscot alrich syndrome and x-linked thrombocytopenia and the mpv is more than 11 means we are going to call it as uh, jain platelets or large platelets where we will see usually uh, inherited uh, thrombocytopenia like m by h9 gene related abnormalities uh, these include Mayheglin, Pechner, Epstein, and Sebastian syndrome. Another uh, platelet function defect like Bernard Solier syndrome. Usually, we are going to see Jain platelets with MPV more than 11. And normal platelets uh, in inherited conditions like congenital hematocytic thrombocytopenia and absent radiate conditions. So, whenever uh, there is a peripheral destruction of the platelets, platelets are usually going to be, uh, be appear as larger platelets in the peripheral smear. Normal to small size platelets, we are going to think that there is a problem in the production rather than in the peripheral destruction. That's why in um, viscot Aldrich syndrome, we are going to see very small platelets that is a production defect like a dust particle almost in the PS. Increased MPV means the usually we will think that those are younger platelets mostly. Young platelets uh, are going to appear as large and this is an indirect evidence that there is a reflection of stimulated uh, thrombopoiesis. Still th thrombopoiesis is stimulated. Other uh, classification is uh, whether it is congenital or acquired. How you will differentiate clinically the based on the history congenital or acquired means based on the time of onset of the symptoms. If the onset of the symptom is uh, very in early infancy or infancy, then we will think in terms of congenital or late onset, we will think in terms of acquired. Not every time, but uh, usually that is uh, acquired. But uh, based on the duration of the symptoms, if it is an acute onset, usually it is an acquired or longer duration of the symptoms means we will think in terms of inherited conditions or congenital conditions. Almost all the conditions in previous slide I explained, the congenital thrombocytopenia conditions, X-linked is viscot Aldrich syndrome or X-linked thrombocytopenia, got up and mutation, male child presented means we have to think if uh, low MPV, all these conditions and high MPV, MIS-9 gene related disorders and autosomal residue conditions, uh, amicacuracity thrombocytopenia and platelet function defect. So these are all congenital conditions. Now, acquired, this is the most uh, common uh, condition we are going to see in the regular practice. Those are immune causes, immune thrombocytopenic purpura, and in neonatal age, neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia, and after transfusion, blood transfusion, as a transfusion reaction, we are going to see post-transfusion purpura. And in coming to the non-immune causes, different uh, mechanisms, because of shortened circulation, uh, we are going to see in uh, DIC due to sepsis or other uh, causes, and macroangiopathic hemolytic anemia conditions and heparin induced thrombocytopenia. And a localized DIC is also like in Kasabak merit syndrome also, we are going to see thrombocytopenia and decreased production. This is especially in case of aplastic anemia or infiltration due to uh, some solid tumors or leukemia and all these regular conditions, we are going to see decreased production. And based on the mechanism, how we are going to classify under these headings, especially in the sequestration conducts to splenomegaly conditions and hemodilation related. This, uh, this entity is uh, usually we'll see in adults rather than in pediatric age group, where in case of polytrauma, whether, where they're going to give whole blood transfusion and massive fluid therapy, because of the dilution, they are going to see thrombocytopenia. So reduced reproduction, reduced reproduction, this is another common entity we'll see as a hematologist, that is aplastic anemia. Aplastic anemia, reduced reproduction because uh, bone marrow is not going to work properly, maybe due to acquired or constitutional, Whenever we are suspecting aplastic anemia, first we have to see whether the, that is uh, there are any inherited bone marrow failure syndrome features like short stature or fluid spots or um, any absent radii or bony abnormalities. Then if those things are not there clinically means we have to suspect acquired aplastic anemia. And then bone marrow disorders like leukemia, lymphoma and HLH. HLH is uh, whether, whether that is due to primary, primary or secondary to any other infection, we will see reduced platelet production. So some conditions regularly we'll see these, uh, uh, those conditions are uh, caused thrombocytopenia by two entities like reduced production as well as increased destruction. This is ITP and nutritional anemia and severe and acute and chronic infection and paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. So increased destruction, as we know, uh, we are going to see in, uh, immune thrombocytopenic conditions as well as hemolytic uremic syndrome, autoimmune causes and uh, localized DIC 
and TTPs. So how we will approach the thrombocytopenia? Whenever you are seeing a culture report as uh, showing as thrombocytopenia, first we had to ask history like any other case. History is more important because uh, what type of bleeding is a child is having, whether that is a superficial bleeding or deep bleeding to differentiate that is a platelet bleed or coagulation defect bleed. So how we will differentiate based on the bleeding? So skin and mucous membrane bleeds, usually we are going to see in platelet defect. But instead of that, uh, deep bleeds, uh, we are going to see like in muscle joint and soft tissues in coagulation factor defects. Uh, bleeding after minor cuts, uh, usually we are going to see in platelet defect. Petechia also usually we are seen in platelet defects. Echemosis we are going to see in both the conditions, but superficial echemosis in primary and coagulation defects, we are going to see palpable large uh, echemosis. Uh, and hematrosis in the coagulation factor defects. And immediately after the surgery, if bleeding is happening, we have to suspect platelet defect. Delayed bleeding means like in hemophilia, we can suspect. So the, that's why our, while approaching, uh, history is very important, what type of bleeding. And we have to ask any travel history to endemic area for malaria uh, and uh, any recent immunizations like MMR, hip, in, hip vaccination, or hepatitis B, and recently the COVID vaccination also, after COVID our vaccination also, we have, we have seen many ITP cases. And HIV risk factors, and we had to ask nutritional anemia, especially megaloblastic anemia, and frequent infection. Many infections can cause thrombocytopenia, regular infections, and we have to see other markers of leukemias like fever, bone pains, weight loss, and fatigue, and any drug intake. So drugs can cause thrombocytopenia like anti anti epileptic drugs, especially where many people will uh, take for uh, epilepsy. Now those conditions also we will see the thrombocytopenia. This is how the history is important and. Uh, whenever we are examining the child, we have to rule out inherited bone marrow failure conditions and leukemia and hemangiomas. We have to examine head and toe, examine the child head and toe, head to toe. So how we approach uh, thrombocytopenia? So um, uh, first we will see on general physical examination whether the child is looking ill or well. If the child is uh, well, then we have to look for any other congenital anomalies. So if congenital anomalies are there means we will suspect inherited bone marrow failure syndromes like Fanconi anemia or trisomy 13, 18 Down syndrome and thrombocytopenia with toxin radius conditions. If there are no congenital anomalies, then uh, those uh, patients who are taking some other medications, they, those are uh, not going to be look like sick patient. So we have to ask any drug intake is there or any toxin exposure is there. Well, we have to rule out that. If that is also not there means we have to ask for peripheral smear are there any macro thrombocytes in peripheral smear? If macro thrombocytes are there means we have to ask for morphology of the platelets. We have to look into morphology. If morphology is abnormal and any WBC inclusions are there, we have to think in terms of uh, Mayheglin anomaly or Henmansky put like gray platelet syndrome. And uh, other, if there are no platelet morphology abnormalities, regular condition with macro thrombocytopenia, otherwise well child, we have to think in terms of ITP, and if bleeding time is prolonged, we have to think in terms of bernard Sollier syndrome. So ITP is basically a diagnosis of exclusion. So um, then if macrothrombocytopenes, uh, macrothrombocytes are not there in the peripheral smear means, we have to ask for bone marrow. In the bone marrow, if the megakaryocytes are adequate or increased, then we have to suspect again immune causes. And if the production is less, we have to think in terms of aplastic conditions or leukemia. This is how usually well-appearing child, we are going to differentiate different causes of thrombocytopenia. If the child is sick, sick means we have to always do coagulation parameters. First, we need to rule out DIC due to sepsis or any other cause. And we have to rule out uh, big spleen by examining the child. Big spleen uh, with thrombocytopenia, we are going to see in valeria, Gotch's disease and portal hypertension regularly. And we have to ask for history recurrent infection in case of male child to rule out VAS and uh, other uh, leukemia conditions. And chronic history is there means we have to rule out autoimmune causes. And uh, in any cystocytes are there means we have to rule out mahas. And acute illness means especially we have to send blood culture and some viral markers to rule out thrombocytopenias. This is how usually uh, we are going to evaluate the thrombocytopenic child. So whenever uh, you are encountering a culture report as thrombocytopenia, always uh, confirm by peripheral smear. Why it is important means sometimes in peripheral smear, we are going to see the platelet clumping. Even though there is no thrombocytopenia, because of platelet clumping, artifactual thrombocytopenia is going to see. If that is, uh, there are no clumping, if it is a true thrombocytopenia, then we have to 
see any other abnormalities. If they are uh, Jain platelets, as I told earlier, WBC inclusion, hereditary causes. If cystocytes, we have to evaluate per maha by doing a reticount, haptoglobin, LDH, bilirubin. If blast bone marrow to uh, rule out leukemia. If microspherocytes, so whenever there is, there is thrombocytopenia along with anemia with spleen, we have to rule out Evans syndrome. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia with immune-mediated thrombocytopenia. This is called Evans syndrome. And if at all any atypical lymphocytes are there, means we have to suspect EB inf EBB infection or some other viral infections. Uh, so we need to do some uh, uh, parameters to rule out all those conditions. If isolated thrombocytopenia, otherwise when cells, all the tests became norm, uh, coming to be normal, then it is a diagnosis of exclusion that whether that is an immune mediated ITP or secondary ITP, we have to think. Uh, this is how we are going to evaluate uh, kids with thrombocytopenia. Now we'll see some case scenarios. Uh, here uh, we are going, uh, here I'm going to explain some uh, common conditions only. Here is a five year old child admitted for an elective surgery. Otherwise, uh, there is no history of bruising or bleeding, no significant family history. On examination, he had no bruises, no ecchymosis. His CVC showed 10 grams percentage of hemoglobin. TLC is normal with platelet count of 20,000. So basically, he is uh, accidentally found to have thrombocytopenia. So when we asked for uh, peripheral smear to corroborate with the peripheral smear findings, we have seen this picture. These are RBCs and this is, these are neutrophils, hypersegmented neutrophils. And these uh, are small uh, cells and platelets. So all these platelets are clumped around this hypersegmented neutrophil. Why this happened means usually we are going to send a sample for CBC in EDTA. So some, uh, in some conditions like pseudothrombocytopenia, we are going to see, this is an uh, entity called pseudothrombocytopenia. They are uh, going to form an IgG antibody in the presence of EDTA. These uh, IgG antibody directed against the glycoprotein 2B3A complex in the platelet membrane. So to avoid this, or to confirm this as a pseudothrombocytopenia, we can send sample in citrated uh, container. Then uh, we are going to see the normal platelet count. This is how we rule out pseudothrombocytopenia. Then another uh, condition, four-year-old female child presented with acute onset of easy bruising and petechial rash for three days. So this is an acute history. There is a history of um, mild fever, cough, cold two weeks ago. And there is no history of epistaxis, active bleeding, like oral bleeding or hematuria no significant family history. Otherwise, child is well thriving, height and weight are 50 percentile, healthy appearing and cooperative child, no hepatosplenomegaly. So CBC showed a platelet of 5,000, other cell lines are normal. Coagulation parameters are normal and peripheral smear also, no clues. So normal. So what we are going to suspect? So this is a acute history. There are no coagulation parameters abnormal, other cell lines are normal, otherwise well thriving child. Age group is four years. So common age group to suspect ITP. So this is uh, ITP, usually immune thrombocytopenic peripheral. Whether we are going to do bone marrow or not to confirm this, uh, this uh, ITP. So some uh, regularly we are not going to do bone marrow if you are clinically very uh, strong that uh, there are no other uh, conditions. But if you are uh, see, seeing other cell line defects like anemia, leukopenia, neutropenia, we have to do bone marrow and rule out leukemias. And bone pains also, uh, we have to do bone marrow. And if any, argonomegaly. Usually in ITP, there will be no argonomegaly and atypical lymphocytes. And especially in some institutes, we will follow that. Before giving steroids, we need to rule out uh, any other abnormal conditions. Once we are giving steroids, means it is going to suppress underlying leukemia or lymphoma. That's why before giving steroids, uh, if you are uh, having doubt, we are going to do bone marrow even in ITP. Otherwise, there is no regular need of ITP according to ASH guidelines also nowadays. So what are the phases of ITP? Newly diagnosed ITP, persistent ITP, and chronic ITP. So when we call it is in a newly diagnosed, up to three months, uh, up to three months, uh, up to three months, we are going to count it as a newly diagnosed. So persistent between three to 12 months and chronic ITP duration more than 12 months. What is acute ITP? It is a, like a retrospective diagnosis uh, until... Uh, they are going to turn into chronic ITP. We are saying it as acute ITP, okay? So how we are going to classify ITP? I'm a little bit elaborating ITP because we are going to see regularly this ITP cases only in thrombocytopenia in a pediatric age group. So primary, primary or secondary ITP. Primary is due to no known etiology only because of immune destruction and reduced production. And secondary, 
Secondary ITP is due to viral infections or common variable immunodeficiency. As I told earlier, Evan syndrome or autoimmune causes like SLE, SLE in, uh, in case of adolescent uh, age group and APLAS syndrome and some lymphoproliferative disorders. We are going to see ITP due to secondary causes. So um, after this, uh, going back to this case, they have uh, given uh, IVIG at a dose of one gram per kg for two days. So after three days, uh, the platelet count is still 8,000. Initially, before giving IVIG, the platelet count was uh, 5,000. Now, after uh, IVIG, the platelet count on day three was 8,000. So how do you manage such cases? Still, it is uh, there is uh, less than 10,000 count and still there is a chance for bleeding. So what is your goal for uh, management in um, uh, ITP cases? Just to increase the platelet count enough to prevent the serious hemorrhage, uh, and to alleviate uh, fatigue or difficulty with activities of daily living. This is our goal, not to achieve the normal platelet count. So in case of mild bleedings are asymptomatic, observation is more important. Uh, grade one and grade two bleeds, we are going to observe the child because uh, most of the times they are going to be self-limiting. And um, in grade three and grade four bleeds, uh, we are going to give therapy to raise the platelets. What is the first line therapy for ITP? There are uh, three drugs uh, available for first-line uh, first treatment in ITP. One is IVIG. The dose is 0.8 to 1 gram per kg. No need to give 2 gram per kg. Uh, the rapid response is going to happen within two days. And uh, the commonest side effects after IVIG is fast uh, administration means aseptic meningitis and headache we are going to see. And uh, another common drug we are going to use is prednisolone. Prednisolone, oral prednisolone is uh, as good as IV prednisolone, IV methyl prednisolone. Oral prednisolone, different regimens are there, like low dose or high dose. 1 to 2 mg per kg per day, we can give even 2 to 3 weeks. Or 4 mg per kg per day, you can give up to 3 weeks by, by giving 7 days and taper up to 21 days. Or it, just 4 mg per kg per day, 4 days uh, you can give, there is uh, no tapering required. It's all like uh, based on the how the patient is uh, going to react. You have to choose your regimen. And um, the side effects are more compared to IVIG for prednisolone, but this is the cheapest drug available. Weight gain, gastritis, hypertension, and mood changes. And long-term usage, um, we can, it can cause cataract and glaucoma. IV anti-D, 50 to 75 microgram per kg. Usually in first line also, this is the last option we are going to use because uh, one is availability and another is only we have to use in RH positive patients. And in case of HB is more than 10 because it, uh, drug itself can cause uh, intravascular hemolysis and there should be no splenomegaly before giving IV anti -D. Even after giving the first line therapy in ITP cases, some uh, approximately about 5% of the case, cases are going to fail to respond to all these first line therapies and uh, they are going to attain relapse even after cessation of therapy. So the ASH guidelines are also mentioned the same observation if there is uh, asymptomatic and IVIG and anti-D in cases of orish positive uh, or non-splenectomized children. So uh, after that uh, IVIG, there is no response on day three with 8,000 platelet counts. So they refer to us. So we have started on simple oral steroids 2 mg per kg per day. And then the platelets are uh, improved to 1 lakh per cubic mm. So now, Gradually, we tapered the steroids and stopped. So how, uh, how you are going to treat chronic ITP? Just for um, discussion sake, for chronic ITP also like an acute ITP, first line treatment or rescue treatment is same with those three drugs, one of the three drugs based on the uh, patient uh, affordability. And then second line drugs and third line drugs are there. Nowadays, uh, emerging drugs are uh, TP4, yes, uh, thrombopoietin, uh, receptor agonists. These drugs are nowadays uh, uh, many centers are using in uh, chronic ITPs. And res uh, even after res not res uh, even after TPORS child is not responding, then we can go for rituximab and uh, 375 mg per square meter uh, uh, weekly, four doses uh, we can use. And splenectomize, uh, splenectomy is the last option. Uh, we have to outweigh the risk uh, benefit ratio while choosing the splenectomy options in chronic ITP. And third line, especially immunosuppressants like mycophenolate moptil, cyclophosphamide, and dapsone. Many drugs uh, have been tried for ITP in chronic, chronic uh, ITP cases. But there are no consensus like which drug we have to choose uh, in chronic ITP. 
So TPORAs, these are newer and effective option for uh, children with persistent as well as chronic ITP, but not in acute ITP, but some centers are trying even for acute ITP. These drugs are like l approved for use in uh, children in 2015, and Romiplastim and Avatrombopag. What they are going to do is, uh, these TPORAs, they facilitate proliferation and differentiation of the megakaryocytes. So how you are going to use l One to five years age group, one tablet uh, once a day, 25 mg orally, and six and... Uh, more than six years age, 50 mg, maximum up to 75 mg, we can use. If there is no response after four weeks of usage, we can think that it is a failure and we can stop l -trambopag. So while using l we had to say that two hours of uh, fasting state and we had to avoid uh, fatty foods before taking this l and calcium containing foods, uh, calcium and antacids. And romiplastin. Romiplastin is an injectable form. It is a recombinant protein with four binding sites for TP1 receptor. We had to start at one microgram per kg. Weekly, we can increase the dose based on the response. If the platelet count is less than 50,000, we can increase one microgram per kg weekly. And if it is 50 to 2, 2 lakh, no need to change the dose. If more than 2 lakh platelet count we achieved means on romiplastin injections, we can continue for two consecutive weeks. And... Um, then later on, you can decrease the dose by one microgram per kg. If you are achieved more than uh, 4 lakhs per cubic mm platelet count, then you have to taper and uh, we have to slowly decrease the dose by one microgram per kg and stop the romiplast. But uh, uh, the main problem with this TPORES is rebound thrombocytopenia and some other side effects with l thrombopag like uh, myelofibrosis and hepatic dysfunction. So this is how we are going to manage acute and chronic ITP. And the next case is uh, like an 80 year old with, uh, with history of easy bruising uh, presented uh, since two years. There is a history of epistaxis on and off since three years of age and history of melina since three days uh, before uh, presentation to us. On examination, she had ecumotic patches and petechae. There is no heptosplenum. Basically, she has a history of easy bruisability. So on uh, evaluation, found to have HB of 8.5, TLC of 5,400, and platelet count of 30,000. Peripheral smear showed a microcytic hypochromic RBCs, thrombocytopenia with giant platelets. And bleeding time we have done, it showed a slightly prolonged. And uh, outside, they have given CRI trial. Uh, there is no response. So uh, she had uh, bleeding manifestations with easy visibility, platelet type of bleeding, and slightly prolonged bleeding and the peripheral smear is showing giant platelets. So we asked for bone marrow because she is having even mild anemia with, uh, even though it is a microcytic hypochromic RBC, two cell lines have affected. So we wanted to rule out uh, some other conditions. So we asked for bone marrow aspiration. So it showed micronormoblastic marrow with adequate megakaryocytes and no abnormal cells. Then we have uh, asked for platelet function studies to rule out platelet function abnormalities. As we are uh, seeing Jane platelets with uh, thrombocytopenia. So what we have seen in platelet aggregation study is, in, uh, there is um, nothing, uh, in uh, this, this uh, test is uh, not possible for interpretation because, uh, because of severe thrombocytopenia, all the agonists showed a decreased response. But that's why we asked for flow cytometry, platelet function tests using flow cytometry by CD41, CD61, CD42B. First two CD markers are to load glandular thrombocytopenia and CD42B is the marker for glycoprotein 1B. So here uh, she showed decreased expression for CD42B, that is glycoprotein 1B receptor. So we have, uh, it is favoring Bernard-Solier syndrome. Actually in Bernard-Solier syndrome, with these five E agents, we have to see Ristosetin uh, decreased activity. Uh, but here because of severe thrombocytopenia, all the agents show decreased response decreased response. How we are going to manage this bernard solier syndrome? She's having microcytic hypochromic anemia. We have started an iron deficiency uh, anemia treatment. And then um, we counsel the parents that uh, mild bleeds uh, means no need to worry. Only in case of severe bleeding, we need to give platelet transmission because this is the only treatment uh, regularly we are using for uh, bernard solier syndrome. Number of times we are going to transfuse platelets means we are going to form, uh, she's going to develop allo antibodies. That's why we had to reserve her only uh, active bleeding and we had to counsel them for avoidance of aspirin and uh, antihistaminics. 
and uh, in case of uh, mild skin bleeds we can advise antifibrinolytic agents like tranexamic acid always we should keep in mind that after confirming this uh, bernard soulier syndrome if child is uh, later on developing multiple severe episodes of bleeding they are the candidates for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation so this is the last case 11 month old male infant presented with history of paler fatigue wound on the right ear and skin rash and scalp rash and he had a past history of respiratory infection and cellulitis and requiring hospitalization with uh, for iv antibiotics on examination he had petechiae and mild hepatomegaly so basically he had uh, some infections and as well as paler and uh, showing petechiae rash the same thing uh, is uh, evident in the lab parameters like 4.3 hb and 30000 platelets with normal tlc and because of past infections we have done immunoglobulin profile which was normal and lymphocyte subset was done to rule out primary immunodeficiencies which was normal and this child uh, direct pum test was positive because of anemia and thrombocytopenia we have done this dct this is positive and bone marrow showed a normal cellular and uh, normal megakaryocytes so what important test we need to ask uh, in uh, peripheral smear and are in the coulter what we have to see so this is because uh, this is a male child young infant and uh, showing repeated infections with anemia and thrombocytopenia we had to look for mpv definitely so this child mpv is 4.3 femtoliters this is an entity called biscott aldrit syndrome we had to confirm this by doing a uh, ngs gene mutation analysis vasp gene mutation we are going to see so in uh, biscott aldrit syndrome uh, we are going to see primary this is a type of uh, pid so we have we even, even uh, we can see uh, common variable immunodeficiency features or autoimmune hemolytic anemia features this is a spectrum actually so we are going to see different varieties of uh, diseases in biscott aldrit syndrome so how we are going to treat this child he is having anemia uh, with the dct positive we are going to give prbc transfusion and severe thrombocytopenia platelet transfusion and prophylaxis we had to start because it is a pid and he is having recurrent uh, respiratory infections and he is having autoimmune hemolytic anemia as well as thrombocytopenia we are, we have started him on ivig prophylactic and later on we had to choose hematopoietic stem cell transplantation which is the definitive therapy for vas so to conclude always whenever uh, you are encountering the thrombocytopenia in coulter reports we have to corroborate with the peripheral smear findings that is more important uh, and it will give many clues and uh, newly diagnosed itp don't be in hurry to give all the first line available agents we had to wait and watch uh, in few uh, few cases observation if no significant bleed and treat the child not the platelet count in itp and reassurance and counseling of the family is more important in any thrombocytopenic conditions and avoidance of contact sports avoidance of aspirin and antihistamines and less than 10000 uh, platelet count in any any thrombocytopenic conditions we had to intervene to prevent ic bleed even though it is very rare in children we had to intervene thank you so <clears throat> thank you dr kasi you had covered the topic so well that it doesn't leave much for the questions i believe questions can be put in the chat box if any but a uh, few points i would like to reemphasize you did it very very well that one point is the thrombocytopenia definition is 1 lakh okay the consensus statement is 1 lakh so, so this is for the all the youngsters don't go for 1.5 it's 1 lakh the second point what is now we see as emphasis now look all now all the you told tertiary care even out the primary cell centers the labs are well equipped they have all sysmex machines so all they have platelet parameters so start looking out the at the platelet parameters the platelet size platelet creat and uh, the mean platelet volumes are very important particularly when we know most of our cases are itp and if we see the platelet size are bigger and we are see, sure that it's itp it gives us more level of comfort if for 25000 for 30000 we don't need to do anything because as the as we can tell in a young army if a people of 25000 people young people can be a battle fighter then 50000 old people so necessary platelets so the platelets as they grow older they lose their size and become smaller so the larger platelets give you more confidence so that point you carried well that when to intervene 
for the infant and for the newborns 10000 to 50 20000 to 50000 and for the other children 10000 to 20000 you can easily well relax okay so that's why now globally the most of the patients the first option for those who are preparing for dm entrance the mcq is the first is observation not steroid not ivig not methylprednisolone not rituximab so the first option is observation you have told that covered it very well you also covered the clumping and edta related issues that is very important so when it happens the citrated blood has to be sent and the peripheral sphere must be examined and <clears throat> the other thing one point i would uh, differ before giving steroids you wanted that uh, indication for bone marrow we don't go for the bone marrow before giving steroid rather if you go with before the second line drugs or rituximab or uh, ntd at that time if you have a doubt the, the issue is if you have a doubt if isolated thrombocytopenia in a well baby you don't need to go for the bone marrow examination so that's all from my side thank you thank you sir Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Satish, next speaker. Satish, unmute yourself, Satish. Satish. Unmute, unmute. Satish, Dr. Satish, please unmute. I could not, madam. Sir, passport loan. Passport loan. Phone just said, huh? Sir. Sir, uh, otherwise I will introduce sir, Dr. Ah, yes, yes. Uh, Sai yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, sir, our uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Sai Subramanian. He's working as a consultant pediatric surgeon in Narayana Medical College, Nellur. So he's done his uh, um, uh, yeah, MBBS and uh, um, Master in Surgery in uh, RIMS, Kadapa, sir. And MCH pediatric surgery from ICH, I am Madras Medical College, Chennai, sir. Now he's working as assistant, assistant professor in uh, Narayana Medical College, sir, pediatric surgeon, sir. Please welcome Sai. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. You can start. <clears throat> Thank you. Sir, I'm audible, sir. Yes, yes. Ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Good evening and my salutations to my seniors and friends. And thank you to Suresh Babu, sir, and uh, Kishore, sir, who always encouraging directly and indirectly to me since my beginning of my career as a consultant, sir. And uh, thanks for giving an opportunity for IAP, AP chapter, sir. And uh, thank you very much, man, Kash, man, for your uh, noteworthy presentation. And, thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, yes, sir. Please share your presentations. Yes, sir. And finish fast. Ah, yes, sir. Sure, sir. And uh, <clears throat> uh, today we are going to share my, uh, my experience in uh, period surgery on case basis, sir. And what and all I am presenting you, uh, each slide is uh, based on the scenarios what I faced in the uh, beginning of my career and practice in Nellur. Slide, and, you can uh, start. Uh, make, slide. make it full screen. Uh, slide slow. Sir. And for, uh, Full Side screen, screen, full screen. screen. Okay, screen. Okay, sir. Yes. Ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> and uh, pediatric surgical emergencies, uh, uh, I water and over three years period in discussing the half an hour is very tough. And uh, but, but what we seen in my practice over nine months, I'm presenting on each side in each case basis. And uh, first of all is abscess. Uh, what I seen is uh, most of the cases of uh, what we are seeing is immunization abscess and uh, post BCG axial infinitis and abscess. <clears throat> and remaining to what we are seeing less frequently is deep tissue abscess or intermuscular abscess. And one more thing is psoas abscess. And one more is uh, myositis fasciitis. First two things are usual what we are seeing. Uh, most of our pediatricians are seeing and treating uh, the initial conservative later uh, sending for uh, surgical procedures. And remaining to uh, one case, what you have seen is eight months old baby. Uh, who who brought, who has been treated in private hospital and child was very uh, having a very high grade fever and sick looking and uh, clinically they have noticed uh, around one fluctuated swelling over entire posterior parietal wall 
and uh, they got an ultrasound CT, they are given as hematoma, they are treated for one week conservatively. By the time they noticed it as uh, abscess and they did end, but the child unfortunately expired. And uh, one more, and uh, most of the cases, deep tissue abscess and intermuscular abscess, they are present clinically in a toxic look and having very high grade fever. If we seen clinically, they may have, uh, they will not have any external appearance of abscess or uh, uh, any painful swellings. But uh, uh, even they, they may present with restricted movements and uh, joint spaces. If you do ultrasound for these patients, they will give a, a localized collection, probably hematoma like that. But uh, only thing what we notice is 100% abscess only. And if we did the uh, IND only, then the child will recover. Uh, so what we are missing is uh, intermuscular abscess or deep tissue abscess. Whenever we are see, uh, identifying such cases, it, uh, it's mandated to do IND, not conservatively. And uh, in case of BCG adenitis or immunization site, uh, uh, initial phase of immunization, they may have uh, inflammation. For such cases, we can give oral or IV antibiotics. And in uh, once it got evolved fully, then we should die ND. And uh, we should never encourage FNAC or needle aspiration for uh, abscesses. Because what uh, I have seen three to four cases in Nilur where they are doing FNAC or uh, needle aspiration and they are giving keeping on antibiotics. So uh, you should never do needle aspiration one. And one more thing is soya sepsis, where the patient will have high grade fever, toxic, toxic look, and he will have limping gait. And they will may they may be uh, they may have a history of uh, uh, trivial trauma. So for such cases, we used to give antibiotics and we will treat conservatively. Meantime, the, uh, the abscess will be fully blown and they may have a pyemia and a sepsis. And finally, the patient may go toxic. So in such cases, we should uh, do clinical examination, uh, do better ultrasound. And we should always think in mind uh, based on limping gait and flexion deformity, uh, soya sepsis. And the uh, second thing is acute scrotum. And uh, these kids, uh, usually they will present with... Uh, is a uh, pain, swelling, redness, or uh, immunoscotal lesion, and thereby they may also tell us uh, my my uh, trivial trauma, and the entire history will present within uh, five to six hours. So what our uh, usual they will come to first time uh, pediatrician only. They will do ultrasound. In ultrasound, they will give a vascular tap. The test is maintaining, and uh, my little peri testicular collection is there like that. They will give. Uh, but in pediatric cases, uh, as a surgeon, what our protocol is, if the scenario is like that, acute scrotum, then uh, it's mandated to go for emergency scrotal exploration. In case of adult, there is a, they will have a marital stasis, sexual life. So they will have epididomarca disease, most common cause. So in adults, we used to give antibodies and treat conservatively. In pediatric age group, uh, we always suspect of tarsitis, tars and appendicitis. Even the, in ultrasound, they are giving vascular disease present. Uh, it's mandatory to go for exploration. And uh, in case of uh, even uh, sometimes they will give TARS now. If you see clinically, there will be uh, tenderness, redness, edema, everything will be there. And testes will be hard, tender, little high up in position when compared to opposite testes. So in such a way, you can uh, think of uh, testicular abnormality, like TARS and appendage or TARS and testes. Either it can be. So in case of TARS and appendage, we will excise the appendage. In case of uh, uh, TARS and testes, if testis is fine, we'll do ipsilateral arcrotopexy. We will fix the testis to the skin. In case it is gone, we will excess, uh, we'll, uh, excess in toto. And we'll save, uh, for the safeguard of the opposite testis, we'll do prophylactic arcrotopexy. And uh, one more thing, what I have seen is undecent testis. Usually, uh, what uh, uh, in private practice I have seen is if uh, a baby born with undecent testis, everybody is doing immediate ultrasound. So it's not worthy for that. And one more thing is they are not, uh, even their telling testes is not there and they are not telling the complications what will happen to the undecent testes. Uh, so uh, as a protocol of uh, first three months of age, there is a possibility of descent of testes. So up to first three months, no need to do any ultrasound because we will not intervene uh, in the first three months. So we no need to do ultrasound. And one more thing, what we should tell to the patient is there is undecent testes and there is a possibility of torsion for testes. And uh, so that's why if whenever uh, undecent is seen, we have to explain them. There's a possibility of torsion. We have to tell the, all the signs and symptoms what will happen if uh, uh, there is a torsion. And in pediatric cases, uh, there are certain conditions where there will be no torsion testes, but uh, they may present with acute scrotum. One is epididymal arcaitis because of ectopic ureters. In case of uh, abnormal uh, uh, kidney urinary bladder system, there will be ureteric inserts in the epididymis or vas. In such case, there will be there. Uh, one more thing is anorectal malformations, where the fistulas will open close to the posterior, close to the 
vast difference opening in the retrograde way there will go for infections and one more thing is idiopathic scrotal wall edema in this case there will be no torsion of testis and anything but the symptom signs everything will be there if you go for clinical examination there will be only scrotal wall edema and the testis will be freely mobile non tender in such way you can uh, differentiate so the gist of this slide is uh, whenever we are noticing acute scrotum uh, it's not managed to go for ultrasound if uh, clinical findings and symptoms are all are correlating it's necessary to go for uh, emergency exploration even on ultrasound there is vascularity is maintained and uh, another thing is mal rotation of midget over a six months period we operate four cases they can present uh, uh, three to four days of life uh, till death and uh, here we operate for 20 days baby 3 months 6 months and 2 years babies and usually the in pediatric case group whenever they may have vomiting but whenever there is a bilious vomiting there is almost always we should rule out a surgical cause because in case of septic ileus in case of some non surgical causes uh, even in nnec they may have some bile stained vomiting because of ileus so whenever there is a bilious vomiting it's mandatory to rule out a surgical cause and these kids will present usually uh, intermittent persistent bilious vomiting. And one more thing is in case of intestinal obstruction only, there will be bilious vomiting and there will have in, uh, intestinal obstruction, uh, abdominal distension. But in case of uh, mal rotation, the abdomen will be soft, scaphoid, and there is no distension. And uh, we will have bilious vomiting. And uh, sometimes some kids, uh, initially one or two episodes will be there and the child will be settled. And again, after five to six days, again, the child will have bilious vomiting. So whenever the initial episode itself, we should rule out uh, for bilious vomiting. And what, how we can identify it below, clinically we may have, it's a, it needs surgical intervention. But how can, how we will identify whether it's malotation or not means initial investigation is ultrasound abdomen. In ultrasound abdomen, we will see uh, rotation of axis, uh, supernumicentric artery and vein axis. Usually, uh, vein uh, SMV will be lateral, uh, left side and SMA is, will be, uh, uh, SMV will be right and SMA will be left. And there will be rotation of SMV over the, SMA. So in such way, we are, it's a wonderful sign. Here I, in, uh, I kept the depic uh, depicting the ultrasound pictures where it's showing a uh, SMA, SMA axis and rotation. And uh, it's the clinical picture depicting the uh, left. Uh, first picture is uh, it's normal fixation of bowel loops. Uh, in second picture, it's showing the valvulus where there is small and large balls is rotating over themselves. So that because of this valvulus, there is a complete uh, devascularization of the small bowel will happen and entire small bowel will go gangrene. If it happens, the survival of the child will be very difficult. And in this first picture, the ultrasound picture showing the distended stomach and duodenum. And the same picture can be identified in the annular pancreas or second part of duodenal obstruction. So along with this picture, we can uh, see the SMA, SMB axis rotation. And the next second picture is showing plain X-ray abdomen and chest where they're showing a very hugely dilated stomach and it is a hard to place it. This may suggest for uh, mal rotation, not confirmatory. In case uh, we have seen in ultrasound, uh, even we, uh, we want to confirm it, uh, then we have to do upper GA contest study. Uh, first picture is in a contest in stomach, second picture is cross in, in the duodenum and left to spine. Usually, uh, in case uh, normal, if you do for normal person, the duodenal jejunal fractures will be right to the, I mean, left to the spine. In case of mal rotation, it will be end up to the left to spine. In this way, we can do a confirmatory test uh, for mal rotation. And uh, uh, this is the interoperative pictures. And usually, mal rotated children will have a severe malnourishment because of uh, uh, intermittent wallless devolvers of the small wall, and uh, so that the uh, lymphatic obstruction will be there. In the second picture here, we can see uh, sports are in mesentery and a very huge large lymph nodes because of uh, lymphatic obstructions. And uh, in the first picture uh, here, usually, Small ball ends with a large ball, but here if you see, this is the large ball, this is the small ball, where there is a valveless, we are disconnected. So this is an emergency procedure. If you uh, delay, then the entire small ball will go for gangrene, then the life of the baby is uh, futile. And uh, in this case, you can do laparotomy or laparoscopic procedure. And one more thing is in, uh, this is called LATS procedure. In this case, we, are, we obviously need to do appendectomy. And so whenever they post a rotation child who presents with pain of abdomen, we don't need to think of appendicitis. And uh, this is the second most common thing, so what we know as seen in periodic cases. And all the etiology, pathogenesis, and uh, medical management uh, 
uh, you people know better than me. And uh, most of the emergencies in pneumothorax, flu, left and empyema. So in these cases, why I want to present uh, the way we can intervene uh, at the earliest. And uh, this is the first is pneumothorax where we are seeing uh, entire lung is pushing medially and uh, absence of uh, bronchopulmonary markings. And in that way, we can identify pneumothorax. And uh, yeah, in the second picture, we are uh, showing uh, where we are going. This is a uh, triangle of safety, anterior pectoralis major, port serially, lattice mass dosi, where we are going to put uh, ICD in the 15 to coastal space just above the rib. Because if we are keeping below the rib, there will be uh, damage to intervascular, uh, inter uh, coastal vessels. And uh, so you nowadays, uh, even troker cannula is available. Even pediatricians can put it directly troker cannula. And uh, and when to remove is the most important thing. In case of pneumothorax, we are keeping ICD till that rotor lung expansion is there and child is uh, recovering well. Once everything is went well, then we will clamp the ICD. What we are following protocol is we will clamp the ICD for 24 hours. If the child has a no, again, new, uh, no recurrent of pneumothorax, child is total and symptomatic, then we will remove. In case of pleural effusion, I say uh, we will uh, see the lung expansion. If we need, we will get a ultrasound to uh, uh, evaluate the collection. And uh, if both are now okay, and if uh, effusion is less than one ml per kg per hour, then we will clamp again for 24 hours. If uh, there is no progression of symptom, then we will uh, remove it. And uh, in case of, uh, uh, if uh, there is no uh, intervention is not available, it's very mandated to intervene, uh, then even pediatricians can put a uh, venflon and cannula in session wherever, uh, near 15 coastal space. And we can uh, keep to under seal water bag Instead of keeping a very big bag, we can keep a small bottle so that the pressure uh, generating by the fluid column will be uh, allow the air to leak out. And uh, in case of recurrent pneumothorax, uh, we used to do, uh, we did only for one case for recurrent pneumothorax, where we did, uh, we used better in for uh, pleurodesis. And in case of empyemothorax, uh, you people know we will keep ICD, we will uh, drain out everything and uh, we will uh, watch for uh, symptoms free and uh, lung expression. If all are went well, uh, we will continue for antibodies for 14 days, we will remove ICD, we will discharge. If in case it's, there is a still uh, lung expansion is uh, not well uh, fully and uh, child have persistent symptoms, then we will go for CECT thorax, where we will see the split pleura thickening sign. Uh, this is uh, taken from uh, internet. And uh, <clears throat> this is the lung, uh, this is the uh, lung window, uh, mediastinal window. Here is the visceral pleura, is the parietal pleura. Uh, because of in the stage three of the empire thorax, there will be vascularity of the pleura, thickened fibrous blast and the vascularity of the pleura. Because of that, there will be enhancement will be there. So based on that, we will uh, <coughs> we can tell uh, we, we, based on CT, we will call it a split pleura sign, and we will uh, advise for <coughs> uh, VATS procedure uh, open decortication. And uh, here, few more excess what I have seen uh, uh, once I start my practice. In first picture, uh, this is of an eight years old child who referred in night two o'clock, and uh, with a uh, fully uh, <clears throat> mediastinal shift is there, and uh, there is a pneumothorax, and in between we are seeing radio opaque shadows. And what uh, I have noticed, uh, and uh, they did CT for this case, and in CT they given uh, cystic lung disease with a large bulla like that they given. So in night two o'clock, what I did is I have a, I have a highly suspicious of pneumothorax, but uh, some misleading factor was there. So I unable to contact to my seniors also. So I kept a venflon for this child. Uh, then I seen till morning uh, because child was stable, having high respirator, but child was stable. So I kept a venflon till the morning. Then I have seen the there is a collapse. I mean again a re-expansion of the lung. Then I confidently kept ICD because uh, for all the radiology for pediatric radiology there is a need experience for radiologist also. And in second picture uh, this was referred by pediatrician with a suspicion of CDH only. And uh, because you don't have availability of pediatrician, you refer to me. And in, if you see this, in this case also, there is a mirror shift and shift is there. And left hemithorax, we are seeing a double loose, uh, two loosened uh, shadows. And uh, here one, and one more is there. And uh, diaphragmatic uh, shadow is not able to see clearly. And uh, that's why uh, on the uh, next slide we will discuss again. For further evaluation, I did upper J uh, contrast study. So here there is a stagnation of the contrast, everything in the esophagus only. So with this uh, way, we, uh, we diagnose the CDH with gastric volus. So always we, we should keep in mind for left-sided uh, pneumothorax, uh, CDH is always differential factor. And uh, <clears throat> so canal diaphragmatic anomalies, abnormalities. 
and uh, whenever we are uh, thinking of cdh we always see extra thorax and uh, abdomen because uh, if you take only extra uh, chest then we will see uh, that uh, heterogeneous opacities but it can be lung anomalies also and uh, if you see extra abdomen abdomen there will be heterogeneous opacity in the thoracic region and there will be uh, few are absent bowel gas shredders in the abdomen in such way and uh, one more thing is we can see there will be absent uh, hemidiaphragm and one more thing is we can see the continuity of bowel loops. In such way, we can uh, identify clearly uh, canal diaphragmatic And uh, if we are taking only half of the thing, then we always think of canal lung lesion. So it's mandatory for the identification of uh, CDH, X-ray abdomen and chest is important. And the even tracing. In even tracing, uh, usually here we are able to... Oh, sorry. In even tracing, uh, we can uh, we can see uh, both hemidiaphragms, uh, but uh, that level of hemidiaphragm is important in the X-ray chest. If in case we are suspecting on left sided, it will be one rib above the level of right hemidiaphragm. In case we are suspecting on right side, it will be two ribs above the left hemidiaphragm. And uh, in lateral, we can see the segmental even tracing. Usually, posterior or medial will be the, there, which will have less significance. And uh, even we uh, we want to cross check again. We can do we can see under fluoroscopic ultrasound, but it is very difficult to see. And uh, there will be paradisical movement of the diaphragm because of uh, less musculature. And uh, they may have in congenitally there will be abnormal phrenic nerve supply. So treatment for this is if child is asymptomatic, it needs only follow. Uh, in case of symptomatic or child have a large functional deficit or child have recurrent respiratory infections or failure to thrive, it needs uh, surgery. Either we can do go for thoracoscopic or thoracotomy or laparotomy, and it is preferable is thoraca, thoracic approach. And uh, what else we are seeing is uh, what I notice is whenever newborn uh, is uh, delivered having abdominal extension, then first invasion what we are doing is ultrasound. Uh, but it is uh, totally unfair for the baby because uh, abdominal distension we should see what for, what is the reason for abdominal distension, whether it is bowel or uh, solid organs anything. So only abdominal lesion, no is sending, but abdominal lesions with warmth, they are sending for ultrasound. So totally it's not worth it for the baby. It's time waste for the baby also because newborn for they are, are taking baby for scanning and they are for bringing back, it is everything is messy. Uh, so first investigation, whenever in newborn, what we are practicing is extra abdomen. In, uh, because uh, even if there is a space acme lesion, still will not present with uh, uh, warm things and abdominal lesions. Uh, only thing is the gas fluid bowel loops. There are uh, uh, bowel atresia or uh, sprung disease or anorectal anomalies, way, or even duodenal atresia, small rotation. All these causes of bowel obstruction and there will be abdominal distension. Uh, but not in mal there will be no abdominal distension. So, this is a case of uh, 36, around 36 hours old life. Uh, they referred uh, to us with abdominal distension. Uh, they referred to one private practitioner. There again, they did ultrasound. After that, they did x ray. And when they came to us, then we know, uh, again, we seen the X-ray. In the X-ray, there is showing an uh, uh, entire radial lucent shadow along the abdominal wall, below the diaphragm. And even we are see, able to see the diaphragmic shadow. So with this, we can uh, tell us pneumoperitoneum. Uh, but this much huge pneumoperitoneum is there, we can uh, suspect of upper GA. Uh, that is a uh, uh, the stomach and duodenum. And one more thing, what we can see, this is the NU2, which is crossing straight very close to the this one. So uh, with this, we have, we have suspicion of uh, gas, uh, stomach wall perforation because uh, for uh, probably we, what we thought is uh, forceful into uh, uh, putting of uh, injury tube, we got injured to the bowel. And uh, this is the interoperative picture where we have seen the entire ganglionus of the anti stomach wall. And this is the injury tube passing out uh, via stomach. And what we did is the uh, posterior wall is good enough and we tubulize the stomach like this. But unfortunately, because of uh, this is the first case for uh, people uh, in Nellur, I mean, uh, in my institution, uh, unfortunately, iatrogenic uh, pneumothorax and postnatally, I mean, postoperatively, uh, child was expired. And one more thing, most important thing I want to share is uh, most of the cases where ultrasound, uh, child will have appendicitis, but ultrasound wise, they, they will tell uh, their appendix is normal or they might uh, not see the appendix. And uh, initial phase of uh, presentation, they may, may doesn't look like appendicitis. Even we do CBC, everything will be normal. And uh, they will send uh, with anti oral antibiotics because of pain and fever, they will uh, send with uh, paracetamol. So the child will obviously have lack of uh, fever and pain, everything, and they will treat conservatively at home. And suddenly they will come, they will present after five days, six days after with severe abdominal distance and irritability, shock of the baby. 
and even we repeat at that time cbc uh, total count will be normal because the child obviously went into shock and uh, even we do ultrasound the same thing will be they, they will give <clears throat> second picture uh, this was five years old child uh, we operated uh, over two weeks back and uh, and one more thing uh, in our practice is if patient presents with fever followed by pain we always uh, give prior to the pediatrician because most of the time that will be physician who have to only treat it if the patient present with pain followed by fever most of the times our surgical uh, cause should be ruled out so in the second picture the patient uh, have a not clear issue and they told her for one week of fever later followed by pain abdomen they she came in night 2 o'clock and uh, ultrasound wise they given uh, gas fluid bowel loops uh, not able to see in the pathology and they advised it for ct then we, again we did ct they told again uh, we are not seeing the where is the pathology and they advised for c ct they taken over 2 hours when we caught uh, we repeated the x ray here the one pattern is there in this small one there will be valvular conventis will be there so here is the concentric circles like that will be there here and here also here it is there so with this jejunal pattern and the clinical shock looking sick looking and uh, irritable child and abdominal lesion severe abdominal pain we taken up for surgery so uh, in both uh, in both cases first and case and second case in both cases there is jejunal pattern is there uh, the, along with that this is this uh, gas flow loops is because of ileus because of uh, sepsis it will cause adjacent bowel ileus so child will present with bilious vomiting so whenever uh, ultrasound uh, child has clinical abdominal distension ultrasound wise not able to see nothing and before getting ct x ray abdomen is most important in the x ray abdomen we can see not only this pattern and we can see the masses next x -ray, next thing uh, we are seeing here so first case is uh, i have seen 8 months back this child is 8 year, 11 years old child and uh, having severe emaciated malnary issue and uh, on repeated uh, asking history also she didn't tell any history of pica and uh, uh, per abdomen wise it is totally scaphoid and uh, no mass is palpable then ultrasound did they are given as colisy studies with the gb stones like that but uh, because of uh, all the clinical scenario we repeated x ray in x ray it's showing uh, this is the gas shadow abdominal gas shadow some shadow and this is the radio pack shadow what we are seeing so it can be so many things possibilities one is uh, within the stomach or else it can be along the spine but the spine is totally normal so we have a suspicion what else it can be then we did a ct in that they are given trichovisor so because of 8 years severe malnutrition we thought of something a uh, tumor also we thought but uh, luckily we got the uh, in ultrasound wise we didn't get anything but in ultra x ray wise we got this thing then we uh, seen same thing in the ct and this is the second x ray where most of the children who, who present with they will take less amount of water they will take more of junk food and uh, if you ask their uh, them they will tell child is passing stools daily but uh, we never ask how much amount of stools is passing how much heart is passing how much time is going for stools that tunnel we are not asking so whenever they comes with the pain severe pain of abdomen ultrasound if you get they will give a normal normal everything normal so if you get a x ray then we will see this heterogeneous opacities all these things is fecal matter so recently i seen one case some 6 years old child at that x ray i missed that one uh, 6 years old child who has severe pain of abdomen and having history of constipation we uh, some pediatrician started pegleck also but she's they are not using that and they again again they came for pain abdomen when i have seen first time i have seen uh, right leg she has severe tenderness uh, but uh, if appendicitis i have to think now then she have two symptoms but she don't have symptoms then again i taken for ultrasound for two times they told uh, appendix is normal then i uh, after that we repeated because of little emergency after that i repeated x ray and showing uh, there is a large fecloma in the uh, left leg fossa so once i given enema then that, that got settled so most of the times even ultrasound wise normal child has symptomatic it's better to get x ray and again we have to ask history of uh, constipation and third x ray this is uh, almost 2 to 3 months old uh, baby uh, having a uh, epilepsy and anti epileptics and uh, pediatrician uh, incident noted uh, having a mass uh, mass per abdomen and antisentesis and they call me and then have seen uh, it's freely mobile so they are possible to have two things one is mesentic cyst and uh, second thing is fecloma so we repeated the x-ray in the x-ray this is the gas shadow within that uh, there is a red opaque shadow is there so it is a fecloma but unfortunately thing we did ct in this case uh, one after giving wash out it's got emptied so not as a ultrasound they may not tell anything because of gas shadow they won't identify what is this thing so always it's better to get x-ray uh, to avoid uh, unwanted radiations for ct and all and uh, this is the case uh, most of the cases are referred from pediatricians only to me and they they are always encouraging to me 
and uh, this is the case uh, since birth and period is only follow up and the newborn period they identified this uh, small pinpoint opening but uh, no other swelling is noted and uh, in due course as they are following with him and they are he's seeing uh, he's seeing every time but uh, he didn't tell anything okay let it be follow up like that but one day the child uh, they present for two to three times the uh, redness uh, erythema everything there and uh, then periods did ultrasound where then they given as neural tube defect so my intention to say is whenever there is a sinus or hemangioma or soft tissue swelling and in due course of time there was a evolving hemangioma was there there are two types of hemangioma congenital and infantile infantile will not be there at the time of birth and in due course of time they will increase so whenever we are seeing sinus hemangioma or any type of swelling over the spinous region it is better to go to get ultrasound because ultrasound uh, in ultrasound itself we can get the pathology within uh, up to 3 months of age no need to go for mri and in case the sinus is uh, uh, within 2.5 cm of uh, anal pit, uh, we no need to do any intervention, no need to do any evaluation. In case the same sinus is more than 2.5 cm above the anal, anal uh, dimple or anal pit, it needs uh, evaluation. And no need to do immediately uh, newborn period. If child is asymptomatic, we can wait till uh, three months or within two months, we can do ultrasound. Then if based on needed, we will do MRI. Uh, here I am, uh, this is the ultrasound picture. Uh, here, uh, this is the spinal canal, this is the spinal cord, this is spinal canal, which is uh, communicating subcutaneously. And this is the same thing, uh, hit the point, this is the connection, this is the defect, this is the uh, intraoperative picture uh, where we did. So whenever there is a dimple or whatever the thing we, we are seeing over the spinal tract, it is better to do ultrasound because it is uh, cheap and easily available. And uh, pyloric stenosis, over uh, eight months period, we operated four cases. Usually these kids will be uh, between four to six weeks of age and it will be rare, very rare after three months. And they, will, they may have family history and firstborn male child and they will have projected non bilious form things. My professor, what you used to say is in case of uh, pyloxenosis, they will have projectile warm things. In case of regurgitation, a projectile warm thing only by a mouth and there will be nothing will come by a nose. In case of regurgitation, they will have, uh, warm, I mean, milk water they, they drank it will come by a mouth and nose in such a way we can different little bit initially they may have a non-bilious non, -bil non, non projectile vomiting later in due course of time it will progress to the projectile vomiting and there will be loss of weight uh, like that so if you see clinically they will have a pyloric uh, mass and visible gastric peristalsis will be there this is one of my cases uh, showing visible peristalsis and uh, because of recurrent repeated vomiting uh, child will have hypochloremic, hypokalemic, hypernitremic uh, metabolic alkalosis with paradoxical aciduria. And uh, so it's not a surgical emergency, uh, but initially it needs medical management. In ultrasound we will see the pyloric mass, 4 mm single wall, 14 mm uh, full thickness and 16 mm in length. And it's always needs a medical management, a medical correction before going taking up for surgery. And uh, most of the times uh, in our institution, we are, we are not putting any tube insertion because there will be narrow communication. I mean, narrow patents will be there, whether the gastric juice will be empty. And uh, before going for, uh, when we are taking for surgery, before going to intubate, we will put NG tube, we will aspirate everything. And uh, for fluid collection, we will give normal saline. Uh, for, after that, we will give off, uh, maintenance for uh, maintenance uh, of DNS at the rate of 120 to 150 ml per kg per day. And once urine output is uh, stabilized, then we will give potassium. And uh, what we are going to do is Ramstead pyloromyotomy. If the lap are open, we are good in lab, open procedure. So first picture is showing the pyloric mass. And second thing is the, uh, what we, use, we are doing is zero muscular myotomy. Zero layer muscular layer. I mean, inside the innermost layer mucosa, we should be keep intact. Uh, so even uh, post-operative period, because of uh, severe persistent uh, peristalsis, there will be vomiting in post-operative period, later it will settle within three to five days. Even if it is persistent after seven days, we need to go for the evaluation. And uh, common period surgical conditions, uh, because why I'm telling is we have few patients uh, used to come uh, with uh, wrong opinion. So phimosis is uh, usual for up to one year, it will be physiological. After one year of age only, we will advise if uh, we are not able to retract the skin, there is history of balloon of prepuce. And inguinal hernia, we have seen most of uh, so many cases where they are telling even you can go operate after two layers or 14 years. 
but the dictum is we should operate at the earliest even uh, preterm baby also uh, by the time they are discharging it's better to operate because in uh, pediatric age group there is more chance of incarceration so whenever you are see identified or noticing a uh, inguinal hernia it's better to uh, undergo at the earliest and hydrocele uh, yeah, as few people are waiting for one year a few are waiting for two years so uh, after even after persistence after two years it's better to, uh, it is advisable to undergo surgery <clears throat> and dysentesis and uh, what I noticed initially, I told already, <clears throat> uh, for antigen testes, people are doing uh, immediate after birth uh, ultrasound. So it's not at all necessary because uh, up to three years period, there is a possibility of descent of testes. Even after that, if you know descent, then it is better to uh, advisable to undergo surgery by the time, uh, at least by age of six months. Uh, because uh, after six months, there is a change, histological changes will be started in the testes. And uh, acute scotum, we already discussed, it needs emergent surgical exploration. For hypospadias, uh, even for hypospadias, people are doing ultrasound. If both testes are descent or uh, phallus, whatever the hypospadic uh, hypospadias is there, both testes are descent, no need to evaluate anything. Even if we want to evaluate uh, for doing ultrasound anything, it better we can do even after two months, three months after. But uh, uh, hypospadias uh, doing surgery it depends on surgeon to surgeon. But uh, we are practicing after... Uh, uh, yeah, for there are so many criteria for doing hypospadic surgery, but uh, most of the times we are operating at uh, 18 months of age. And uh, derma cyst over scalp. We have seen few cases where people are doing CT even uh, uh, two months, three months baby for derma cyst. Um, if we, if anterior fontanel is open up, then we can it is advisable to do ultrasound itself. That is enough. And derma intracranial derma cyst is uh, very less likely. If you want to operate. We can operate after closure of sutural lines. Even if you do operate before that, if there is a possibility of infection, it will directly affect the CNS. So uh, nothing emergency. We can operate after closure of sutural lines, and it is uh, not necessary to do CT scan. And uh, hemangioma, uh, the, as I told, congenital and infantile will be there. Uh, congenital, the size of hemangioma will be uh, there to the maximum at the time of birth. In due course of time, it will settle down. In case of infantile, uh, at the time of birth, it will be very macular, very small patch. In due course of time, it will increase uh, progressively, then it will decrease. So in case it is very widely uh, spatially occupied lesion, uh, it is uh, difficult to operate because we can't cover the skin, everything. So it is advisable to go for propanol therapy. We will start uh, one to two, one to three milligram per kg per day. And uh, in case it is pediculated like that, it is uh, we can uh, operate easily. And in case more than five hemangiomas over the body we notice, then it is advisable to do ultrasound abdomen because there will be liver hemangiomas possible. It will be more if more than five is there. And uh, one more thing is lymphangioma. In case of lymphangioma, there will be microcystic or macrocystic. Uh, there are different types of therapies. Where we are not able to operate, then you can start serolimus. Uh, it will be 0.8 milligram per meter square per day. There will be decrease in size. <clears throat> in case of large cystic lesion, where uh, deep planes are involved, if there is a risk of uh, an injury, then we can start sclerotherapy. Even uh, if we, uh, if need surgery, we can do more suppression as much as possible. We can exercise. In case of biliary atresia, it is advisable to go at the earliest or within 100 days. And cold local cyst uh, also it is advisable to go within three months. Uh, that means 100 days because there is a cystic type of biliary atresia. So between that and cold local cyst, it is a little difficult to differentiate. So it is advisable to go by less than 100 100 days. Uh, because uh, even we can uh, reduce the chance of cholangitis. And in next slides, we will discuss why we have operated two cases. And uh, one more thing is congenital lung lesions. Uh, what I have seen is uh, before uh, antenatally, even there, uh, they identified congenital uh, the lung lesions. Postnatally, uh, they are lo uh, losing follow up or postnatally, they are advising uh, no need to intervene early at the early, like that they are telling. But uh, we have seen four months baby, eight months baby, uh, both have uh, affected uh, with severe pneumonia. So it is better to, uh, most of the cases, no need to go immediately after birth in case of congenital lobar emphysema. If it is uh, life-threatening to the baby, then we can go at the earliest, even immediately after birth. Otherwise, uh, we can uh, wait by three months and we can plan uh, electively. And uh, here I am sharing a few interesting things we have operated in our hospital. And over eight months period, we operated two newborn cases, two TF, one CDS, and uh, remaining case is there. And both TF got uh, survived and went well. And uh, this is my first case we operated. Uh, TF will refer to us by the pediatrician. So all pediatricians will know. There will be coiling of the NG tube 
and there will be history wise there will be dueling of saliva but along with that when we are getting x-ray uh, what we will see is one is spinous uh, because of vascular anomalies we will see spinal deformities uh, cardiac shadow lung shadows and ribs and uh, distal bowel gas shadow in case distal bowel gas shadow is there then we will think of uh, esophageal atresia with a distal fistula in case abdominal gas shadow is absent then we will think it is a pure esophageal atresia uh, one thing and one more thing is what we have to see is coiling usually tracheal bifurcation uh, will be at t4 uh, d4 level i mean uh, t4 or d4 level uh, at the same site only the fissure, distal uh, is of a specialized is most of the time will open into tracheal bifurcation so at the same site we will identify so the level of calling that level of uh, uh, tracheal shadow we can uh, assess the gap between the upper pouch and the distal fistula if that uh, is very less then uh, the, the probable, probability of leakage will be very less in such way we can identify uh, so whenever we are seeing a TF, we can see the coil, level of coiling, multiple anomalies, lung shadow, cardiac shadow, distal bowel gas shadow. So this and all we will see when we are getting a uh, ease of electricia. And these are the interoperative pictures. First picture is upper pouch and uh, second picture is uh, post anastomosis. And this is the po position in what way we are keeping and we will give post at the thoracotomy and we will keep the ICD uh, just below that. And another thing is anorectal malformation. These are the most, uh, all these cases will refer to us by the pediatrician only. Uh, so for ease of uh, uh, understanding to the patients, I'm uh, giving a small thing. Usually anorectal malformation will uh, class into high intermediate low. Uh, so this will be uh, theoretically, so I'm not explaining much. And uh, so in case of low anomalies, this is male child, in case of low anomalies, uh, the fistula, if we see here, it is this is anal uh, pit, uh, covered anus, this one. So, still tuberosity, if you give a line, uh, here is the normal anus, clinical if you see. So, if it is very close to that, so I can do, I can think of it as a low fistula, a low ARM. So, in this case, I will show next picture. If in case this is the same thing, if it is there, then I should think of high ARM with fistula, a uh, high ARM with the fistula. So, because of it is very close here, even I am thinking it might be high ARM with a small tract connecting to the skin. I did PTL view after 24 hours. Here it is very close to the skin. Uh, so, we confirm it is a uh, low ARM. Then we did uh, uh, like this. It's still two brush will be there. Like this, we take a skin flap, we operate this one. So, single stage, uh, this is a triangular anoplasty. Single play stage, we operate this case. And this is high ARM. In high ARM, the fistula, there will be, uh, an, uh, bowel will be end up very high level. So in this case, what is the problem is there will be abnormal muscular, uh, annular sphincter, abnormal uh, gluteal musculature, and even they will have an absent sacral uh, sacral uh, bone, even uh, spinal abnormalities will be there because all of these things they may have uh, presented with uh, uh, uro, I mean, uh, urinary incontinence, even the fecal incontinence will be there because of abnormal uh, sphincter complex. So in this case, we did after two, uh, 24 hours PTL review. If you, cry, you draw a line, this is pubic bone. If you, uh, no, not this one, here it is there, it is ischium. So if you draw a uh, line parallel to the pubic bone and uh, I mean sacrum, the distal gas shadow we'll see. If it is just above that, it is high ARM. If it's below that, it's low ARM. And if there is another entity, it is the intermediate. Eye line, PC line will be there. If below, this is the eye line, uh, tip of uh, IC line like this here. If below the eye, eye line, it will be lower. In such case, we can do primary directly triangular anoplasty. And uh, so in anorectal malformation, we can do if low ARM, single stage anoplasty. In a high ARM, here I did a colostomy, sigma colostomy first stage. Second stage, I will do ASRP or PSR or abdominal perineal approach. And third stage, we'll do the colostomy closer. So like this three stages, we have to operate. And uh, this is one more case uh, we got in uh, our institution. They got delivered uh, inborn only. So they given the baby to the mother also because uh, they have seen the one opening. Uh, they thought uh, uh, they, they were given to mother. After one or two days, uh, they came back. They are in the, within the hospital only with the mother. So again, they brought the child. After that, they noticed that there is an absence of anal face, but child is passing meconium. Uh, so usually what I, they call me, then I thought it might be fistula, an rectovaginal fistula, but uh, I mean rectovestibular fistula. But when I came, went and seen there is a single vaginal, a single opening is there. And when I am catheterizing there, I am able to see the meconium stain. And I am not able to see erythral opening and the absence of anal face. So this is called cloacal anomaly. It means the rectum, vagina, and uh, all urological uh, structures will join into common channel. 
and uh, so we did x-ray abdomen again in this case uh, so in this case if you see there is a hugely dilated gas field i mean the radiolution shadow and it's crossing the midline so with this i suspect i'm uh, one entity is there pouch colon with this i'm uh, i thought it is, might be pouch colon so this is a case of cloacal anomaly with pouch colon then i we operate we did surgery for this child and again incidentally we see the meckel's diverticulum so because the uh, newborn period and it's a wide base, we didn't intervene anything for Meckel's. And uh, that is still entire whatever the dilator loop, this is the dilator loop here, intraoperative picture. And usually this shall have abnormal vascularity and abnormal musculature. So it will not be helpful for the baby in future. And we did ileostomy in this case. And uh, finally, we have to pull the ilia, ilia loop down to the perineum. So the prognosis of the child might be incontinence, uh, morbidity will be more. And a CDH we already discussed, and this one interpreter. And one more is post valve. Sir, uh, sir. Sir, sir, I went, sir. Over, sir, over, sir. Faster. Ah, yes, sir, yes, sir. We did vesicas in this case. He is bladder extropy. Uh, so, in this case, uh, pubic bones will be very wide open and the absence of rectus sheath. And we operated this, uh, we mobilized the bladder and we closed it like this. And uh, two cases of lung dissection uh, we done. Uh, this is a pathology. This is after a post excision. Uh, this is the serious what I told. Uh, there is double gas shadow here. The absence of a few bowel loops are there, and we did upper GI contrast study. And this is interoperative. This is usually dilated stomach. It was taken half an hour to mobilize the uh, stomach from thoracic into abdomen, and we did a uh, uh, gastropexy because to prevent gastric valvulus. And this is six years old child where having a anus very close to the vagina. She uh, under, didn't underwent surgery because of COVID period and because of uh, uh, their fear. And at six years of life, we did directly. Uh, we mobilized the entire anus and rectum and we repositioned the thing and child is fine. And uh, two cases of cold local cyst. I, as I told this child, one is eight years, one is 10 years. And we used to operate like this. We will exercise the entire tract. We'll take one small bowel loop. We'll do anosmosis. And one more small bowel, small bowel anosmosis. Like this, one, two anosmosis we will do. Uh, we did two cases like this. And one more is hypospadias. This is a uh, distal and one is a uh, proximal hypospadias. Like this. Uh, here, uh, this uh, looks like female gentilia. And but both these uh, tesis are there in the inguinal canal. And we reconstructed a scrotal sac and we repositioned in first stage. And we will tubulize in second stage. And we operate on cleft lip and palate. And thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Sai. Exit, exit. Yes, yes. Thank you, Sai, for your very interesting and elaborate presentation. Yes, yes. Sir, CM, sir, anything to add? No, thank is... you, Sai. Sai, you covered it so well that you didn't leave anything unturned. And from the uh, abscess, to yes. the gross anomalies of the diaphragm as well as the GI system you covered well. And one point worth taking was emphasis on X-rays. Yes, yes. They remain the most important modality as the first line. You yes. see, ESG has the propensity to miss many things. Yes, so sir. this is a take-home message for the, all the youngsters. The yes. X-ray, the old X-ray is still holding its fault. Yes, sir. Thank you. Anything to add, sir? Or will close sessions? I think. Thank you, sir. Sir, yeah. Ramakrishna, sir. Ramakrishna, sir. Yes, thanks, uh, Dr. Sure. Uh, Kishore. Yes. Uh, both the speakers have done well. Uh, if uh, they are a little deceptive, deceptive. Uh, may I add that, Sai? Yes, sir. Uh, you have done a very exhaustive presentation. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, maybe it is required for it's yes, not over it. Yes. For residents who are doing MCH yes, sir. pediatric surgery rather than for pediatricians. Yes, sir. What all we want is what are the clues to diagnose early? Yes, sir. When to refer? And before referring, what we are expected to do. Yes, sir. And what is the timing for cool cases? As Dr. Yes. CM was telling. X-ray remains the best modality for diagnosis for GIT in the abdomen, what I mean abdomen, much more so in acute cases. We have spent more time on clinical features, 
Yes, sir. X-ray features. Yes, sir. We are not much bothered about the. See, it's a crude yeah, statement yeah. when we say that not much bothered. How operation is done? How we yes, do? Because we anyway we don't understand. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, in your next uh, presentation, I think you will be presenting more yes, on yes. how not to miss. Yes, sir. How we are likely to miss, you will be knowing better. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How the obstetricians do the delivery, we know better. Yes, and sir. how pediatricians miss a surgical case, especially acute case, you know better. Yes, sir. So let it be acute case or a little chronic case. Yes, sir. Give the clues how not to miss. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's the part I feel. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And we want some common conditions only. Yes, sir. Just the things, when to refer, how to refer, and how to stabilize before. Suppose there is no pediatric surgeon for us. How to yes, we have, of course. How to refer, how to stabilize first. And then send it like that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And okay, the need for surgical intervention will not be there in a good number of cases. You yes, may sir. have enlightenment when actually in a particular condition, a child may require surgery. Right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank inputs, you. Not to hurt you because I am no, asked no, to no, give some no. inputs. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Right. Okay, sir. Uh, yes, sir. What up? Thanks. Thanks, sir. Uh, thank you, Vanandal. Uh, thank you. First of all, I would like to give thank you to Chandramoha sir for spending very valuable time with us. And uh, I, I would like to thank all the Central IAP and the state uh, EB uh, members and our president, Dr. Suresh Babur sir, and uh, Ramakrishna Param sir, sir, and uh, Uber Lady sir, and uh, other dignitaries. And uh, I would like to thank you, uh, uh, Kasi Bharti ma'am for her presentation, good presentation and uh, Sai Spurmanyam for his elaborate presentation. Thank you, Anandal. Thank you very much. For, thank you for joining this evening, sir. We'll meet you in next uh, URCM in next month, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, CM, sir. Good night, CM, sir. Good night, CM. CM. All others. And last, I would like to thank our DA members also for giving this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Good thank night, night you. Thank you all. Good night, sir. Namaste, sir. Namaste. Namaste.